We throw the label superfood around like it's some kind of magical thing that's going to make us just be perfect. Right? And ultimately, all it comes down to is just a marketing tool to be able to slap a label on something, call it a superfood, and mark it up by 30 or 40% to take your hard-earned money. That's just pretty much what it comes down to. Okay, the truth is there's a lot of superfoods that are in disguise. Okay, nutrient-dense foods that we wouldn't think are nutrient-dense. We'd look at them and we'd say, oh, that's just bland or that's just boring or that's, that can't be a superfood. We automatically think kale, broccoli, things. Let me just break this down. These are going to be a few superfoods that you wouldn't think are nutrient-dense superfoods. I do want to ask you, please hit that red subscribe button and then please hit that bell icon to turn on notifications. And please remember, I'm not a doctor. Okay, this is for informational purposes only. I'm just some dude on the internet, but I happen to lose 100 pounds and I'm pretty good at biochemistry. So let's break this down. The first one I want to talk about is sardines. Sardines make the cut because, well, quite frankly, we think superfood, we think expensive. Sardines are not expensive. Sardines are pretty dirt cheap and you can get them just about anywhere. Okay, the reason they make the list is because they have so much in the way of vitamin D. And let me talk to you about this for a second, okay? Because normally when you eat fish, you're eating a fillet of it, which means you're eating like the muscle meat, which is great, but you're not getting the full plethora of nutrients and minerals and vitamins that you would normally get. With sardines, you're eating smaller pieces, which means you're typically getting some of the organs, you're typically getting a little bit of the bone, the scales, the skin, stuff like that, which is making it so that you're getting the vitamin D that you need. You need the vitamin D, you need all the minerals that are coming along with it. So super high in selenium, super high in zinc. It is like a literal superfood. It is probably one of the most nutrient-rich foods that's out there. But one of my favorite things about sardines is the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. You don't really find foods out there that have such a tremendous ratio of anti-inflammatory omega-3s to omega-6s. So definitely recommend that. The thing is, is with sardines, you always wanna to try to opt for them in water or brine whenever possible. Soy, avoid it like the plague. And a lot of times the olive oil is lower quality olive oil. So just make sure you're paying attention to that. Okay, the next food that's on this list you're gonna love, Parmesan cheese. Look at. Dairy isn't bad because not all dairy is created equal. We have to remember that. Please let that ingrain in the mind as much as you can. Not all dairy is created equal. Okay, first of all, it comes down to the source of the dairy, which we can talk about on a separate occasion. But Parmesan is aged and cultured with specific bacteria for so long that it has a pretty cool effect and it transforms the dairy, it transforms the cheese. You see, the biggest issue we face with cheese, in my opinion, outside of it just being calorically dense, is the fact that it has pro-inflammatory effects because of the casein proteins. It's hard for us to break down the casein proteins. They have sometimes a negative response within the body, which is why cheese can sometimes be not too great for you. Well, it turns out that because Parmesan is aged for so long, the bacteria has a chance to break down those casein proteins into a more usable form that the body can assimilate meaning we don't have the negative aspects of the dairy as much. Plus, we get kind of a cultured effect with the probiotics that are in cheese. That's right, there's actually some probiotics in cheese. But if you're on a diet and you're trying to lose some weight, there's even an extra benefit that comes with Parmesan. You see, one of the biggest problems that people face is as they go on a diet, they're used to these just hyper palatable foods, these really strong, bold flavors, these uh, sweet flavors, salty flavors, oily flavors, and then all of a sudden they're just eating bland stuff. Or Parmesan is so robust and so pungent, it satisfies that psychosomatic effect with that pungent taste. So it's very, very good if you're on a diet. Next one is one that you're gonna be very happy to hear is on this list. Good quality beef. Good quality beef makes the list as a nutrient dense food because if it's coming from good quality cattle that has been eating good quality food, you are what you eat ate. So if you're consuming beef that comes from a cow that's been eating rich grass, that's rich in nutrients, it's going to have a good omega-3 profile, it's going to have good levels of minerals, and it's going to be an overall just better food for you to eat than meat that you're gonna get from the store. So not all beef is created equal, but one of the things I talk about a lot is hemi-iron. Hemi-iron is a usable form of iron in the body. It's not iron that's getting stored in a different state that could end up causing issues. It's iron that is usable and it's going to help red blood cells and help your overall blood blood and your vascular system and your circulatory system. So in my opinion, beef definitely makes the cut. By the way, if you want to check out my source of beef, I usually use ButcherBox. I put a link down below in the description. They're an online meat delivery company, grass-fed, grass-finished meat, really good quality stuff. And most of the time, you're going to end up spending less than you would at many grocery stores, simply because you're not having to use the gas, you're not having to drive there, not have to use your time. It gets delivered right to your doorstep. It's super cool stuff. So highly recommend you check them out. Special link down below in the description. 
for beef, for chicken, for fish. They have all kinds of things. So definitely check them out. Okay, moving on. The next one is one that you probably are aware is a superfood. So it's not a real big surprise. Good quality eggs. But very important, bad quality eggs are really bad but good quality eggs are really good. All right, the big thing I like to focus on with eggs isn't so much the fat profile, sure, that's great, but I'm more focused on the choline. It's hard to get good quality choline, which is a precursor to acetylcholine. Okay, that's a neurotransmitter in your brain that's very, very important for just overall neurological function, neurological health. We're so busy focusing on the veggies, the kale, the broccoli, all that stuff, which is great, it's rich in nutrients and vitamins, but all those just get excreted right out of your system. We need some stuff that's fat soluble, we need some stuff that's suspended in fat in our food so that we actually get the proper utilization of those nutrients. So anyway, that one makes the list. Now, this other one, buckwheat. Buckwheat is really cool because it's what we call a pseudo cereal. It is like a cereal, but it's not really a cereal, in fact, doesn't have any gluten in it. You know my story on gluten. I'm not a big fan of it. I tr feel that it can trigger inflammatory responses via lipopolysaccharides and different responses. Anyway, cereal grains are usually a no-go. Okay, but buckwheat doesn't even have that same correlation that some cereal grains would have with gluten. For those of you that have seen a lot of my videos over the years, you know what I'm talking about. Super high in copper, super high in zinc. Two minerals that are quite difficult to get a lot of in an American diet at least. Then when we look at some of the other pieces, something called rutin. Now rutin, is a natural ACE inhibitor. Okay, so some people take medication for that. Well, it turns out that buckwheat has a pretty powerful effect. Not saying it should replace it, but it acts in a similar fashion. And then when you're looking at something that's gonna help carbohydrate metabolism, it has something known as d chiroinositol This is going to help with carbohydrate utilization. So here you have a cereal like carb that could be baked with, cooked with, whatever, but it has a built-in ability to kind of neutralize the carb effect. It's pretty awesome. Anyhow, let's move on. Sesame oil. We think sesame oil, we think good Asian cuisine. We don't exactly think healthy. We think maybe some stir fry or we think some chow mein. We think, you know, a lot of this Asian cuisine. So we don't associate sesame oil with being healthy because we're too busy thinking of olive oil and these other ones. Turns out that sesame oil has sesame and sesamolin, which are two of the most powerful antioxidants that you're gonna find in foods. But what's even cooler is that when you heat sesame oil, it levels up and increases the amount of sesamolin by seven times. So imagine this, you take olive oil and you heat it up. It denatures and breaks down because it ends up going through lipid peroxidation, it ends up going through this uh, basically free radical buildup where it breaks down. But then you take a look at sesame oil, you can heat it to a high temperature and it forms a protective mechanism to protect it even more. So the antioxidant power just gets even more powerful. So you can take sesame oil and it can help combat some of the negative effects of poor quality oils simply because of the antioxidant effect. So sesame oil all the way for the win. Then we have sweet potatoes, which might not be a big surprise as a superfood, but they're surprisingly nutrient dense, not because they have just basic vitamins and minerals, but because they affect the gut biome. If you've ever had sweet potatoes, sometimes you feel a little bit gassy after you have them. It's not because you're not a you know, they're not agreeing with you. It's because it is stimulating the production of short chain fatty acids and helping out what are called intermediary bacteria. So it's kind of acting as a gut fertilizer, helping form what is called butyrate or butyric acid. This is a direct fuel for the cells within your gut. Okay, this helps them out in multiple ways. If you're feeding those cells within your gut, then those cells have the ability to help form a tighter barrier and keep bad things in the gut from going into the bloodstream. So long story short, indirectly, it's a superfood in a different category, plus high in astaxanthin, which is pretty powerful for the brain as well. The next one is one you're gonna be happy to hear about, popcorn, but not microwave popcorn, okay? Don't go get like some low quality popcorn. I'm talking about organic, clean popcorn popped in an air popper. Okay, I don't like to mix fats and carbs, so I don't like to recommend uh, cooking popcorn in oil. Use an air fryer. Popcorn is not something you wanna be eating every day, but it just has a lot more nutrient value than people give it credit for. Again, you're not gonna sit down every night, watch Netflix and eat it, but I think that if every couple weeks you wanna have some popcorn, if you pop it yourself, you're looking at a relatively low calorie snack, you're looking at something that is extremely rich in magnesium and phosphorus, but also really high in fiber. It's not just completely devoid of nutrients. Yes, it's a grain, yes, it's corn, it's not something you wanna have all the time, but it definitely makes the list as a surprisingly nutrient dense food. The last thing I wanna talk about is beets. We know of beets as being something that's probably somewhat nutritious. Maybe they have you know, some vitamins and minerals, but did you realize they are a super performance enhancer? 
Okay, I used to use beats all the time pre-workout before I was doing keto. This was like a thing that used to work really well for me when it would come to workout time. Okay, they are a vasodilator. They're high in nitrates. Now we think nitrates and we think deli meat, automatically bad. No, naturally occurring nitrates are good. They help oxygenate the blood. They help with actual blood flow. Now, a Journal of Applied Physiology published a study, took a look at individuals and gave them 500 milliliters of beet juice for six days. They had tremendous improvements in time to exhaustion. They found that their overall oxygen cost was lower, and it all had to do with the fact that beets end up improving that nitrate content, which improves mitochondrial efficiency. It means the mitochondria can utilize oxygen easier. So when I say oxygen cost, it means it costs less money in your body to acquire oxygen and utilize it for fuel. So yes, they make the cut. They make the cut as a performance enhancer. Some would even argue that they're too much of a performance enhancer and they've talked about even outlawing it. It's that powerful. You don't need much, a little bit goes a long way. Anyhow, thanks for keeping it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.